Welcome to the complete story of Final Fantasy XVI. A tale of honor and betrayal, bonds and brotherhood, magic and mankind. And last but not least, doing everyone's dirty work as if you had nothing better to do. It's a good thing Clive has those big, broad shoulders to help him carry the weight of the world on his back, since society would probably cease to function without him. Striking a more mature tone for the franchise, Final Fantasy XVI's story is one filled with political intrigue, human drama, and sometimes an excessive amount of swearing. And the result is a video game epic worth experiencing, as well as worthy of being relived. And that's why we're here. But anyway, I'm Peter from Birds of Play, and in this video I hope you'll join us for our longest complete story video to date, and hopefully ever. So strap in for a magical ride, whether you're watching every minute intently, listening while working, or just taking the longest trip of your life to the bathroom. It's going to take a while for us to get from here to understanding the meaning of life, but I hope you'll stay with us all the way to the end, helping us keep the fire alive. In the realm of Valisthea, a land blessed by the light of the Mother Crystals, the night burns red as twin titans clash. The Phoenix a beacon of hope ever since time immemorial, and Ifrit, an aberration and affront to the very laws of nature, for there can be only one icon of fire. Their battle shakes the very foundations of the earth, but alas, it is now but a memory of a young man as he gazes into the heart of a living flame, thirteen years having passed since that fateful day. It is the 873rd year of the Valisthean calendar. And as dawn breaks over the Nysa Defile, an arid labyrinth of high-walled ravines within the Dalmechian Republic, the young man and the band of assassins he belongs to review their mission. Their sergeant, Tiamat, reminds them that their target is Shiva's dominant and only the dominant, cautioning them that their kind do not question orders. The young man touches the brand they've all been engraved with on their left cheek an unmistakable symbol of their station in life. As they leave, Byast puts the fire out using ice magic, springing directly from his hand, and the young man looks to the newly risen sun, its fiery glow raising the realm once more, as if reborn in the wake of the cold dark night. Tiamat calls out to him, breaking his trance, referring to him as Wyvern, and telling him to focus and sees the key to the mission's success. The four men then reach a cliff overlooking the valley below, and bear witness as the armies of Dalmachia and the Iron Kingdom meet each other on the field of battle. As the battle rages, much blood is spilled on both sides, although the Iron Blood, who they consider more beasts than men due to their backwards beliefs, seem to have the upper hand for the time being. On the other side of the battlefield, safe inside the Sinitra stronghold, a Dalmex convene a council with Barnabas Thama, the king of Walud. They ask for his kingdom's aid in battle, but the king refuses. As the room goes silent, Benedicta Harmon takes the floor, telling the Dalmex to have faith in their own men. She reminds Eugene Havel, the field marshal of the army, that if things go wrong, they could always have their dominance take the field. However, the Marshal is reluctant to deploy their dominant, since the Iron Blood are now said to have a dominant of their very own. Hugo Kupka steps out of the shadow, casually overpowering the Marshal with his massive build, disrespectfully blowing smoke in his face as he declares that as the dominant of Dalmechia, he will make the Iron Blood rue the day they ever set foot on the continent of Storm. As Kupka takes his leave, Benedicta chases after him catching him in the hallway and leaping into his arms. She tells him to be careful, but he dismisses her concerns, telling her that all he requires is someone to warm him when he returns from slaying Shiva, the Warden of Ice, Benedicta seeming open to the idea. Meanwhile, the band of branded assassins continue to survey the battlefield like hawks in search of their prey, their plan being to conceal themselves in the chaos as they carry out their dark deeds. However, as they try to approach their target, they are blocked 
by the emergence of Titan, the Warden of Earth, who breaks onto the scene, towering over the mountains themselves. As Titan takes to the field, so does Shiva, the two icons displaying godlike powers as they engage each other in battle. The sorry souls, unlucky enough to get swallowed up by their confrontation, meeting a swift and indifferent end. Braving the peril of their clash, the branded assassins attempt to navigate the ever-shifting terrain brought on by their battle. But as Titan rages on, Yast is hit by a flying boulder and crushed. Wyvern almost meeting the same fate as a tower topples over in his direction. Narrowly escaping with his life, but not unscathed, Wyvern is dragged away by Tiamat, all the while calling out to his brother as he loses consciousness. While knocked out, Wyvern is reminded of simpler times. Thirteen years ago, in the year of the realm 860, in the Grand Duchy of Rosaria, his homeland. Back then he was known as Clive Rosfield, the first shield of Rosaria, protector to his brother, Joshua Rosfield, the dominant of the Phoenix, the Warden of Fire. At the time, Clive was training under the tutelage of Lord Commander Rodney Murdoch, while his brother and Jill Warwick, a former princess from the Northern Territories, and their loyal pup Torgal watch on. Heeding Lord Murdoch's instructions, Clive is finally able to overpower him, using everything he has taught him, as well as the blessing of the Phoenix, a power bestowed upon him as the first shield, much to the amazement of everyone present, his victory having been a long time coming. His body spent from the sparring contest, Clive falls to his knees to recover. So Joshua uses his powers as the Phoenix to heal him. However, Clive asks that he not waste the gift of the Phoenix on him, especially since Joshua's constitution is weak, meaning that he mustn't push himself too hard due to his ailing health. Suddenly, they are visited by their mother, Annabella Rosfield, who has braved the filth of the castle's bailey to collect Joshua, reminding him that he shouldn't be outside due to his frailness. But even though she shows much love for Joshua, Annabella does little to hide her obvious disdain for Clive's existence. As she leaves, the men whisper among themselves that the Duchess's coldness is no way to treat your own flesh and blood, saying that Clive is not at fault for not having been born the Phoenix. As the Archduke of Rosaria, Elvin Rosfield, returns home with his retinue, he asks Clive to come to the throne room later, telling him that war is coming and that they must make ready. On the way there, Clive catches an apple rolling on the ground and picks it up. He then sees a distraught man carrying a box of apples, the man's face bearing the same mark as Wyvern and the other assassins did. Clive wipes the apple off using his clothes and hands it back to the man, at which time the man's slave master interjects, telling Clive that he mustn't concern himself with such a bungling cur. Clive tells him that it's quite all right, but the slave master insists that he shouldn't indulge him since simply being allowed to stand in his lordship's presence is more than his kind deserves. The bearers in Rosaria not being treated half as badly as they do in the neighboring dominions. As Clive bids them farewell, he asks that the bearers' good fortunes continue, implying that the bearer shouldn't be treated so harshly on account of his birth. Alwyn welcomes Clive in the throne room and tells his well-mannered eldest son to dispense with the pleasantries since his mother isn't there. Clive asks whether the territories his father was inspecting fare any better, but Elwyn shakes his head, telling him that most lie under a pall of black, as the blight has taken lie all of the northern reaches, it only being a matter of time before it crosses the border. He tells him that the capital is already full with refugees, fleeing the deadlands, and even if they were to send them south to Port Isolde, more would only follow in their wake. This means that they must move against the Iron Kingdom to secure Drake's breath for the duchy, as without the blessing of the Mother Crystal, they cannot hope to defend their realm from the spread of the Blight. Elwyn tells him that tomorrow they will ride for Phoenix Gate to listen to the words of their ancestors, as tradition dictates, before any big battle, but that there is something else he would have him do first. At this time, Lord Murdoch steps forward, 
telling him to travel to the Stillwind Marshes and clear them of beastmen from the north who have been sighted within their borders, offering him two good men to accompany him. Once they have cleared the marshes, they are then to join them at Phoenix Gate. Beckoning Clive to his side, Elvin tells him that this is the time to prove his strength and shut his mother up for good. That night, Annabella approaches Elvin in their bedchamber, asking him to spare the frail Joshua the trouble of traveling to Phoenix Gate. However, he replies that his presence as the dominant of the Phoenix is necessary to perform the rites, as only the dominant can enter the apodetary to listen to the words of their ancestors. Annabella protests, telling him that the boy is ill, but her pleas fall on deaf ears, as Elwyn tells her that as the phoenix and heir to the throne, they cannot swaddle him forever. Elwyn assures her that Clive will watch over him, but Annabella is less than impressed, reminding Elwyn that the phoenix rejected Clive as his dominant, their household having no place for such a failure, a man like any other. Elwyn reminds her that he too is but a man, only sitting upon the throne because his father was taken before his time, his role being to warm the seat until Joshua comes of age. Pushing him down onto their bed, Annabella says that as his father's firstborn son, he has every right to sit upon the throne, Elwyn not having disgraced their noble blood the same way Clive did. Thwarting her advances, however, Elvin reminds her that without men like Clive to keep them safe, her precious noble blood would long since have graced the gutter. Elsewhere in the castle, Clive and Jill share a tender moment beneath the stars, gazing up at the moon together. Jill asks whether he is going with the others, and Clive replies that as Joshua Shield, he is sworn to protect him. He then tells her that he has been given his first command, leading a mission into the marshes. Upon hearing this, Jill prays to Metia, the burning red star that sits beneath the moon, wishing for his safe return, a single tear running down her cheek as she appears lost in thought as to what might happen, the idea of war greatly frightening her. Jill says that since being brought to Rosaria from the Northern Territories, she has come to take peace for granted, assuming that the war between their nations would be the last. Jill is worried about Clive, but as she comforts herself in the cold evening air, Clive hesitates to put his hand on her shoulder, instead telling her that they should return inside, Jill bidding him good night. The next morning in the bailey, Clive leaves his trusty chocobo Ambrosia in the care of one who would take her to Phoenix Gate, and as the garrison sound the horns, Elwyn and the others ride for the gate, leaving Clive behind. Once left to his lonesome, Clive is then joined by two knights, Sir Wade and Sir Tyler, both of whom are honored to serve alongside the young lord as they set off for Stillwind together. Once in the marshes, Clive and the others hunt down the goblins in the area, driving them out of the ruins of Stillwind. The inhabitants of the village already having fled from the encroaching blight. As the leader of the beastmen runs off, however, it is swallowed up by a monstrous morble that emerges from the swamp without warning, the monster giving the Knights of Rosaria more than they bargained for. Rising to the occasion, Clive and the others nevertheless vanquish the foul beast, noting that the appearance of a morble this far south is unprecedented and indicative of the worrisome spread of the blight. The three of them headed to Phoenix Gate to join the others, where Wade regales the men with a tale of how his lordship Clive bested the goblin chief and the mighty Morble, much to the amusement of everyone present. At the end of the hall, Elvin and Joshua have a little heart to heart amidst all the ruckus, Joshua telling his father that it doesn't seem fair that the phoenix only runs in their bloodline, giving them power over others. However, Elwyn tells him that the fact Joshua has been blessed to be a dominant and to wield the power of an icon means that he must share that power with the people, this being his sacred charge. The men suddenly burst into song, singing the praises of Rosaria and the Firebird. 
Joshua taking this opportunity to slip out, thinking he won't be missed. Outside, Joshua runs into Clive and Torgal, Torgal having followed them to Phoenix Gate, instead of staying at the castle with Jill. Joshua tells Clive that all the men were impressed by his accomplishments, but Clive tells him that it wasn't always like that, and that when he first joined the ranks, everyone thought he was just a spoiled little lordling. Clive tells him that Joshua is the one they truly believe in, but Joshua doesn't believe him, telling his brother that what they truly believe in is the power of the dominant, and that Clive is the one the phoenix should have chosen, since he himself doesn't have the strength to lead their people. Clive tells Joshua that every man has his duty, and that theirs was decided long ago, when their ancestors chose to instate the dominant as the Archduke of Rosaria, telling Joshua that just as he was born to bear the fate of Rosaria on his shoulders, Clive was born to be his shield and use the phoenix's blessing to keep their future rulers safe. Having gone to bed, Joshua is stirred from his slumber by the sounds of battle, just before Wade comes rushing into the room, telling him that an unknown enemy has already set fire to half the castle, and that he must get him to safety. Using the power of the phoenix, Joshua fights alongside Wade, showing that his magic is formidable despite his frail constitution. Wade notes that their attackers are wearing Sunbrequa garb from the Holy Empire of Sunbrek, even though Rosaria is allied with the Empire. Pushing on, Joshua and Wade find Tyler mortally wounded in one of the hallways, but Joshua uses his powers to heal him, saving his life. Clive then comes bursting into the room, overjoyed to see his brother safe and sound. They are soon joined by His Grace Elwyn and Lord Murdoch the two of them thanking Wade for rescuing the young prince. Heading for the rear gate, Elwyn sends a Stolas messenger owl to Rosalith, bearing news of the horrors that have transpired there that night. Clive then leaves Joshua in their father's care, telling Joshua to keep their father safe in turn. Meanwhile, Clive intends to hold the enemy there while they make their escape. Saying goodbye to Joshua, Clive and Lord Murdoch return to the thick of battle, where they fight an imperial dragoon in the courtyard, truly solidifying the Empire's involvement in this tragedy, although the reasons for the Empire's betrayal remain a mystery. Lord Murdoch discovers a Rosarian sash in the possession of one of their attackers, noting that those particular sashes were issued but yesterday, implying that there might yet be more traitors in their midst. Hurrying back to Joshua's side, as he might still be in danger, Clive calls out to Ambrosia, but is suddenly interrupted by a vision of a mysterious cloaked figure who speaks to him, although the figure's words are unintelligible. Meanwhile, their fears prove correct, as Joshua is attacked by fellow Rosarians, one of the soldiers throwing the mangled body of the Stolas Owl at Elwyn's feet, ensuring that none will learn of what has happened. As they try to take Joshua, Elwyn leaps to defend him, at which point he is decapitated by one of his former allies, his blood splattering all over Joshua's face. At first, Joshua whimpers in fear, but as he remembers that Clive is counting on him, he unleashes the power of the phoenix. First entering a semi-prime state, his human body fused with that of the phoenix before he lets it all out, becoming fully primed. As a consequence, he reduces all those present, including the loyal Tyler, to ashes, before taking to the skies. Having lost control, Joshua attacks indiscriminately, or whether his targets are friends or foes, and as Clive rushes to save him, he himself is saved by Ambrosia, who pushes him out of harm's way, the loyal Chocobo steed getting hit in the head with a boulder in his stead, saving his life. As Clive approaches the phoenix, he is overcome by a gnawing pain, bringing him to his knees, and as he looks around, he once again sees a mysterious figure, this time engulfed in flames. Suddenly a pillar of fire shoots up into the sky, and from the hellish flames, Ifrit arises. Close by, Lord Murdoch stares in disbelief, as there can be only one icon of fire. 
However, his bewilderment is short-lived, as the horrid heat of Ifrit's flame quickly disintegrates the Lord Commander. Ifrit turns to face the phoenix, the night burning red, as Joshua ascends high into the sky before diving down and crashing into Ifrit, breaking the ground beneath his feet. The two icons plummet down into the depths below, locked in a deadly embrace as they reach the sacred apothecary, hidden far beneath Phoenix Gate. Joshua fights Ifrit, noting there can only be one icon of fire. But as they return to the surface, Ifrit gains the upper hand, ripping into the phoenix, tearing the icon limb for limb. As Ifrit pummels the life out of his brother, Clive's voice begs the beast to stop hurting him, Clive swearing vengeance for his brother's murder. As the dust settles, soldiers from Sunbreak survey the ruined remains of Phoenix Gate, their captain giving Annabella his condolences for Joshua's death. Annabella says that having lost Joshua, her world, she can only pray that there will be a place for her in the new world, his radiance the Emperor of Sunbreak seeks to create. As the captain discovers Clive among the rubble, he asks Annabella what his fate should be. But as he prepares to kill him on Annabella's orders, she changes her mind, instead telling him to take Clive away and put him on the Imperial front lines. As they leave, the soldiers slay Annabella's handmaidens in cold blood, so that none may know how she betrayed her homeland of Rosaria. Finally regaining consciousness, Wyvern is welcomed back by Tiamat, and they are soon joined by Avis, who tells them that the Iron Blood Crusaders have sounded their retreat. Wyvern reminds them that they are down a man, but Tiamat says that if they return without Shiva's head, their fate will be no different from Biast's, there being no escape from the fate of the Brandit. By taking their chances with the Iron Blood, they might at least die fighting, all of them agreeing that they won't be dying today. As they navigate the newly formed landscape, a remnant of Shiva's and Titan's recent encounter, the remaining band of assassins spots the dominant of Shiva, being led in chains by Iron Blood Crusaders, as they retreat from the battlefield. The Iron Blood's less than stellar treatment of the dominant is symptomatic of their faith as they believe them to be unclean aberrations born of blackest sin. As the assassins descend upon the Iron Blood, a crusader threatens the life of an innocent child to spur Shiva's dominant into action. Reluctantly picking up her sword, the dominant does battle with the branded. But the three men manage to knock her out, no doubt thanks to her already having exhorted her strength to fight Titan. However, before they can deal the finishing blow, Wyvern recognizes her as the Jill he once knew back in Rosaria and refuses to take her head. As Avis steps up in his place, he is hit by an Iron Blood axe and instantly killed. The Iron Blood attack them, hoping to reclaim their dominant. But as Wyvern and Tiamat thwart their advances, they turn their blades on each other. Tiamat accuses Wyvern of betraying the Holy Empire, but Wyvern says that he doesn't recall ever pledging his allegiance to the Emperor, his service having been bought with a brand on his face, but not his loyalty. The two do battle, Tiamat reminding Wyvern that it was he who plucked him from the front lines, who trained him, who gave him a name. But Wyvern retorts that he's always had a name, and that he hasn't forgotten it, reclaiming his identity as that of Clive Rosfield. Clive ultimately bests Tiamat, but his victory is but momentary, as it isn't long until he is surrounded by Iron Blood Crusaders once more. As all seems lost, Clive holds Jill tight in his arms. But as the Iron Blood go in for the killing blow, they are stopped by thunderbolts of lightning, very, very frightening, sending them flying in all directions. Suddenly, Torgal, now a fine hound, appears from the ensuing smoke, in the company of a man who tells Clive to follow him. With no other recourse, Clive does as he says, all the while carrying Jill to safety. 
Standing atop one of the cliffs, Benedicta surveys the battlefield, all the while speaking ill of Patton's dominant for not succeeding in crushing Shiva completely, saying he has to work harder if he is to claim her as his prize. Benedicta's right-hand man, Geralf, notes the thunder in the distance, implying they might want to do something about it, but Benedicta replies that they'll be hearing more of it soon enough, instead telling him to gather the men so that they can get to work. Putting Jill down as they stop to rest, Clive is still in disbelief at having been reunited with her after all these years. Afterwards, he catches up with Torgal and the man who saved them, saying that since they are acquainted, he shouldn't mind taking him off his hands. The man then reveals that he knows him to be none other than Clive Rosfield, recognizing him by the blessing of the Phoenix, empowering him in battle, although he didn't come out for him, but instead Jill. He tells Clive that they plan on taking her to a safe place, and asks a large fellow who has been accompanying them to carry her the rest of the way. The large man refers to their mysterious benefactor as Sid, his full name being Sidolphus Telamon, noting they must hurry back. Sid invites Clive to join them, telling him he'll explain everything once they're back at the hideaway. However, to get to the hideaway, they must first brave the deadlands of Central Storm, a place already sucked dry by the blight meaning no trees, no birds, and no magic. And thankfully to them, no neighbors. Reaching the hideaway, Clive enters a deadland sanctuary, hidden deep within the ruins of a lost civilization. The remnants of the fallen, whose relics can be found across the length and breadth of Valisthea. Clive can barely believe his eyes, and asks how they survive without magic. Sid explains, the key is hard work and wits. Passing Clive an apple grown within the Deadlands, although Clive passes on the offer. Jill is put in the care of Taja, the resident physica, who tells the large man, Goots, to carry her upstairs to the infirmary. Sid then invites Clive to visit him in the Sola, where they discuss Clive's next course of action, Sid reminding him how the Empire deals with deserters, telling him he won't be getting far with that brand on his face. Clive asks what Sid intends to do with Jill, but Sid retorts that he has no plans for her and that her life is her own now, Sid's only wish being to help dominants like her and branded like him. He tries to recruit Clive to their cause, but Clive says that until his brother is avenged, he must walk his own path. Sid then tells Clive that one of his scouts just sent word of a group of branded fugitives north of the hideaway, in the imperial village of Lostwing, a dominant of fire allegedly being among them. As this is Clive's only clue to finding his brother's killer, he agrees to accompany Sid on his mission, but before they set out, Clive surveys the hideaway, meeting the people there and becoming more familiar with their cause. Having made their preparations, Clive, Sid, and Torgal travel together through the Great Wood on their way to Lostwing, the Crystal Road not being an option due to them being outlaws. As they travel through the woods, they happen upon some more ruins left by the Fallen, and Sid says that according to some accounts, there was a time the Fallen cities blocked out the stars their cities once floating in the sky, before they came crashing down. Moving on, they come upon a hungry beast, Fabnit, and as the beast refuses to stay down, Sid is forced to semi-prime to smite it with thunder, revealing himself to be none other than the dominant of the icon, Ramu, the Warden of Thunder. Clive asks why he is helping dominance and bearers, and Sid replies, that he only wishes to offer their kind a choice, a place where they can die on their own terms. Deeper in the woods, they encounter a royal scout from Malud and decide to follow him, the scout leading them back to Benedicta as she interrogates a local as to the whereabouts of bearers in the area. 
rewarding his service by taking his life. Sid recognizes Benedicta and tells Clive that she's the commander of Walud's elite intelligences. Sid thinking about capturing her before they are spotted by the men she left behind. Once again impressed by Clive's battle prowess, in no small part bestowed upon him by the blessing of the Phoenix, Sid wonders whether the other alleged icon of fire gives out a blessing as well. Clive suspecting that he doesn't fully believe him about there being a second icon of fire. Uncharacteristically quoting doctrine, Sid then recounts how each element is always had but one warden, and that a new dominant can't be born until the previous dies, even if that takes years. However, Clive doesn't strike Sid as a liar, so he's willing to give him the benefit of the doubt, for now. As night falls, they arrive in Lostwing, a village built around the ruins of a fallen airship, though its flying days are behind it. There they look for Sid's scout, Gav, and find him locked away along with the bearers he was looking for. Sid sets them free, but when he asks Gav whether this is everyone, Gav tells him that the royalists from Walud came just before they arrived, taking some with them, the supposed dominant possibly being among them. Suddenly, their little rescue operation is discovered by one of the royalists, who goes running back to Benedicta, leading Clive to give chase. Upon seeing him, Benedicta believes Clive to be an imperial bearer on account of his equipment and brand, and summons Girada to take care of him. Girada being an Aegis, an ethereal conjuration born of Benedicta's power as the icon Garuda, the Warden of Wind. As Clive defeats Girada, Benedicta is impressed, drawing her own sword with the intent of finishing the job. However, as they are joined by Sint, Benedicta laughs and asks whether this is how Sid recruits all of his charges. Benedicta had once served under Sid when he was still loyal to the kingdom, Sid being Walud's former Lord Commander before he grew tired of the king's antics. Another royalist arrives on the scene and tells Benedicta they have secured the dominant. And upon hearing this, Benedicta creates a gust of wind, escaping along with her men. Not knowing where she is going, Sid sends Gav to scout the area. Discovering that they have fled to Caer Norvent, an imperial stronghold located on the southern fringes of the Empire. There, Benedicta interrogates a mysterious hooded man, inviting him to join their ranks, threatening to kill the woman he is traveling with if he doesn't comply. Before they set off from Lostwing, Sid introduces Clive to Quinton, the owner of the local tavern, telling him that he is one of those sympathetic to their cause. Quinton tells Clive that as someone marked as a bearer, Clive's inquiries will fall on deaf ears, and gives him the seal of the hanged man, which will loosen the tongues of those loyal to him in Lostwing. Putting the seal to good use, Clive asks the town people about the dominant of fire, and one of them describes a cloaked man, followed by a female escort wherever he went, both of them having been dragged off by the royalists. Upon hearing this, Sid believes that the Dominant is holding back from burning everyone to a crisp on account of his lady friend being held hostage. Finally infiltrating the care, Clive spots an old sluice that empties under the bridge, believing it can serve as their secret entrance to the lower levels. At the top of the care, Benedicta inspects her pendant, the Wings of Promise, and thinks back, remembering herself in bed with Barnabas as he spoke of founding a new order, uniting the dominance and restoring the world. Benedicta replying that his dream might already have become a reality if Sid hadn't betrayed them. Barnabas, however, is less than impressed by her prattle, asking whether she still lusts for Sid's embrace. Benedicta vehemently denying the allegation as she straddles him, assuring the king that she serves him and him alone. Barnabas reminisces about the time she first entered his halls, her pale hand 
pressed into Sid's, as if she would never let him go. Benedicta tells him that that was a long time ago, and that his is now the only hand she needs. Benedicta's walk down memory lane is interrupted by Geralt, who tells her that one of their sentries has failed to report in. Guessing as to the reason why, she tells him to pull the man back inside the care and have them lead Sid and his little pet to the chapel. Once he's alone again, she exclaims that Sid has come for her after all. Once they reach the chapel, Benedicta is there to greet them. Benedicta telling Sid she was waiting for him, and Sid replying that she hopes she wasn't waiting for too long. Sid asks her where the dominant is, but Benedicta says that Walud will be requiring his services indefinitely, asking Sid to come back to their side as well, telling him to envision the world they could build. Sid scoffs at the prospect, telling her he wants no part of her king's world, much preferring his own vision for the future. He says that Barnabas' dreams are as twisted as his promises are false, and that he refuses to be used by Barnabas, as Barnabas now uses Benedicta. Enraged by his words, Benedicta says that Sidolphus knows nothing of her, and he concurs, telling her he doesn't know what she is anymore. He only knows what she used to say, that she was tired of running, that she just wanted to be free. He accuses her of having sold herself to get what she wanted, but Benedicta says that she has used her talents to her advantage and that there is no shame in that. Sid retorting that if there is no shame, then why does she feel so sorry for herself? Recognizing that their conversation isn't leading anywhere, Benedicta decides that the time for talk is over, instead entering her semi-primed state, sprouting wings and attacking Sid as he activates his power to match hers. Benedicta throws Sid into a statue of the great Grigor, the one true deity of Sunbrek's Gregorian church, toppling the monument and leaving him for dead. Afterwards, she summons two of her conjurations, Gerada and Supana, to take care of Clive, but he once again bests her familiars against all odds. Clive runs to Sid's side, but he is too injured to stand, so Sid tells him to catch up to Benedicta before she flies off with the Dominant. Doing as he says, Clive meets Benedicta again at the top of the car, Benedicta once again being surprised by his strength as he defeated her so-called sisters. Benedicta offers Clive the warmth under her wings, as she has uses for a man of his talents, but Clive refuses her enticements, instead demanding that she hand over the Dominant. The two of them do battle, Clive managing to disarm her and force her into her semi-primed state. Benedicta tears off a piece of the care and lunges it at Clive, but Clive dodges her attack, countering with the blessing of the phoenix. As Clive breaks her priming, Benedicta exclaims that he is but a bandit, refusing to believe that she's been brought this low by one such as him. At which point Sid appears, telling her it was because he was fighting for something he believed in. As Clive tries to grab Benedicta, a green burst of energy breaks forth from her chest, her icon's essence joining with his. As this happens, Clive is overcome by tremendous pain, as a mysterious voice in his head exclaims, There you are. Benedicta seeks to use Clive's sudden tantrum to launch her counterattack, but when she tries to summon Garuda's power, she can't manifest it, saying that she is gone, ordering Clive to give her back. Without warning, the care is rocked by explosions, and Geralt arrives to carry Benedicta away, as Sid stays with Clive, dumbfounded at Clive having stripped her of her power, taking it for himself. As the care starts to crumble due to the ensuing fire, Sid surmises that the Dominant must have escaped, and that they too must evacuate. Once outside the care, they are reunited with Gav, and Sid thanks him for leading the bearers to safety. Upon hearing what has transpired, Gav offers to track the Dominant, going on ahead to begin his work. Elsewhere, Benedicta is still distraught at the loss of Garuda, saying that Barnabas will cast her out like all the others. 
Suddenly, they are ambushed by a band of ruffians who kill Geralf and the rest of her entourage. But as they descend upon her in her powerless state, Benedicta is reminded of her past and how she was saved by Sid, the light in her life going out as Sid eventually left her behind. She asks herself whether this is her punishment for not listening to Sidolphus. But as the bandits try to put their hands on her, she sends them flying, a powerful tornado forming around her as she curses the world, saying it all deserves to die as she enters her fully primed state as Garuda, rising high above the trees. As Clive and Sid spot the tornado, the mysterious voice inside Clive's mind returns once more, this time spouting Mythos, Mythos in succession, the meaning of its words lost on him. Sid says that Benedicta has drawn in too much ether and that she can't control it, meaning that if they don't stop her, the vortex will swallow the entire forest and them along with it. Having heard a familiar voice beckoning him, Clive believes he's being called into the heart of the raging storm and runs off in his direction, throwing caution to the wind. Inside the Eye of the Tempest, Clive once again spots the cloaked figure he saw back at Phoenix Gate 13 years ago, believing it to be the dominant that killed his brother. A piece of rubble separates Clive from Sid and Torgal, forcing him to go alone. And as he chases the mysterious cloaked figure to the edge of a cliff, Clive is led straight to Garuda. Clive once again fights Benedicta, this time in the form of Garuda, all the while demanding to know the location of the dominant. Clive is able to hold his own against the icon until she catches him, but even then he refuses to yield. The mysterious voice returns, calling him the child of fate, telling him to awaken to the power of Ifrit. Suddenly a pillar of fire lights up the sky as Clive is transformed into Ifrit, resulting in a battle of icons, desolating a huge waft of land and leaving the ground charred as Ifrit emerges victorious. Sid tells Clive to control the icon, but as Clive continues to relentlessly beat on Garuda, Sid interjects in the form of Ramu, quelling Ifrit's rage for the time being. As Clive returns to normal, Sid notes that the ghost Clive has been chasing was inside himself all along. He then discovers the bloodied wings of Promise Pendant lying next to him. He picks it up and looks for Benedicta, finding her already dead. He returns it to her, having been the one to give it to her in the first place, and bids her farewell with a heavy heart for the last time. Some time later, the Holy Empire of Sunbreak fends off an army of royalists from Malud as they invade their territory, King Barnabas being among the invaders, fully primed as Odin, the Warden of Darkness. On the other side of the battlefield, Prince Dion Lesage of Sunbreck watches on, turning into Bahamut, the Warden of Light, as he jumps off a cliff, taking to the skies. The two icons battle one another, but no clear victory emerges, so Dion returns to camp as the foot soldiers continue to clash. There, Sir Terence, second in command of the Dragoons, brings the Prince news of saboteurs in the capital, which necessitates that the city guard be strengthened, meaning they can't expect any reinforcements. Believing that the safety of the Emperor is paramount, Leon takes the news well, vowing to deal with the invaders without any help. As Clive awakens, he finds himself chained and naked in one of the holding cells of the hideaway, grappling with the fact that he himself was the dominant he'd been looking for, that he was the one who killed Joshua. He is joined by Sid shortly, but as Clive begs him for the mercy of death, Sid punches him, instead choosing to impart on him his timeless words of wisdom, telling him that since he's still breathing, he might as well make himself useful. After Clive has gotten dressed, Sid tells him that Gav has picked up the scent of the mysterious dominant of fire he had been hunting, the very same one who had reduced Kaer Norvan to cinders. Although Clive is hesitant, he accompanies Sid to meet Gav at the King's Fall in Sandbrek, near the Rosarian border. 
There, they hear the unmistakable sound of an imperial hunting whistle and split up to search for Gav. As Clive finds Gav, he runs to his rescue, Sid arriving in the nick of time to even the odds as they take on an imperial dragoon. The imperials corner Gav on the precipice of a waterfall, but his rescuers save him at the last moment, pulling him up as he hangs for dear life. Having saved Gav from the clutches of death, Gav tells Clive that the dominant he has been searching for is on his way to Azaria, there being no question in Gav's mind that the man is in fact a dominant of fire. Knowing himself to be a dominant of fire, and that his brother is dead, Clive struggles to believe it, but Sid persuades him to nevertheless get to the bottom of this mystery. Elsewhere, the mysterious cloaked man and his female retainer stop to catch their breath, the man saying that they will soon be back to where it all began, fire burning in the palm of his hand. As he removes his hood, he reveals himself to be none other than Joshua, fully grown and very much alive, saying that there is someone he must stop. As Clive and the others return to the hideaway, they are eagerly greeted by Tarja, who informs Clive that Jill is finally awake. Clive goes to her, and the two of them are finally reunited outside the field of battle. They embrace one another, both having trouble believing that the other is alive. Jill tells Clive how she was abducted by the Ironblood, who invaded not long after the news arrived about Phoenix Gate, killing the men and capturing the women. However, before they could have their fun with her, Jill awakened to her powers as Shiva's dominant. As a result, the Iron Blood forced Jill to fight for them, threatening to slaughter her countrymen if she disobeyed their orders. Clive then tells Jill the story of what happened at Phoenix Gate, telling her that he is the one who killed Joshua, as the second icon of fire. Upon hearing this, Jill decides they should go back to Phoenix Gate to ascertain the truth of the tragedy that occurred 13 years before, facing whatever truth they may find together. As they journey back to Rosaria, they are greeted by the familiar sights of the countryside. However, they soon find that the intervening years have been no kinder to the land in which they were raised than they were to them, Rosaria being firmly under the heel of the Empire. They travel to Martha's Rest in the swampy lowlands of southeastern Rosaria, where they speak with Martha, the landlady of the Golden Stables, a tavern at the heart of the settlement. As Martha is sympathetic to Sid's cause, she tells them that to get to Phoenix Gate, they should take the road through Eastpool. However, the bridge just collapsed, and Bernard, the carpenter in charge of fixing it, has gone missing. Clive offers to find the missing carpenter, and once he and Jill have brought him back safely, he quickly resumes work on the bridge. As they wait for Bernard to finish the repairs, they have a little talk with Martha, who tells them that since the Empire took over, they started confiscating the bearers of Rosaria to put them to work elsewhere. The Empire's inhumane treatment of bearers being in stark contrast to how they were treated during Archduke Elwin's reign. Martha then asks them to take a donation to Glademont Abbey while they wait for the repairs, so that they may see the darkness at the heart of this world. As they get there, the abbot introduces them to bearers lying on their deathbed. The bearer's curse has taken hold of them, as they have been forced to draw on the ether, resulting in their bodies becoming petrified until naught remains but stone and pain. Clive and Jill share a bearer's final moments, the tragedy of it all leaving a lasting impression in both of them. Back at Martha's rest, Martha gives Clive the slumbering chocobo seal, so that others sympathetic to their cause might know that they are one of them. As she watches them leave the tavern, Martha rejoices in the fact that Lord Rosfield and Lady Warwick have come back to them, hoping for them to stay for a long while yet. As they reach Eastpool, Clive is recognized by a blonde woman who tells them her name is Hannah and that she is Rodney Murdoch's wife. Clive is overjoyed to see her, and Lady Hannah bursts into tears upon seeing the two of them alive. 
Lady Hannah invites them to her home, where she offers them a drink and a place to stay. But as they talk, Clive discovers that Lord Murdoch passed away on the night of the fire, never returning from Phoenix Gate, adding yet another life lost to Clive's conscience. During the night, Clive and Jill sleep in the stables, as Clive cannot bring himself to sleep under the same roof as the wife of the man he killed. He tells Jill how avenging Joshua was the only thing that kept him going in these thirteen long years, killing in the name of the Empire, and that now that he has discovered that he is to blame, he's not sure how he can go on living. Jill has a similar story to tell, having slaughtered so many in the name of the Ironblood, so many that she herself wished for death. Having shared their death wishes with one another, they reminisce about the last time they met on the balcony at Rosalith, Jill praying to Metia for Clive's safety, her prayer now finally having been answered, meaning that the heavens must still have a plan for them. Their eyes become trapped in each other's gaze before they bid each other good night. The next day, Lady Hannah gives Clive some of his father's old clothes, telling him he looks just like Elwyn at his age. Clive thanks her for her kindness, and Lady Hannah says it's what Elvin would have wanted. Bidding farewell to Lady Hannah, Clive and Jill head north. But Clive is recognized by the mayor of Eastpool, who asks him to pay a visit to one of the elderly bearers, who still swears absolute loyalty to Archduke Elvin. Finding the bearer overlooking the village, the delirious bearer mistakes Clive for Elvin, Jill telling Clive to humor him. The memory of serving the late Archduke having been the old bearer's one light in the darkness, Clive rekindles it, allowing it to burn a little more brightly. As they arrive at Phoenix Gate, the ruins are still and silent, much as they were on the day after the disaster thirteen years ago. Yet, Amidst the shattered stonework and blackened beams that Clive recognizes all too well, he catches the sight of the hooded man he has been chasing. Desperate to uncover the truth, Clive and Jill pursue the figure into the halls of the gate, a relic of the fallen that only the dominant of the phoenix can open. With the figure nowhere to be seen, Clive uses the blessing of the phoenix to open the gate allowing them passage into the apothecary, although their unwelcome presence stirs the echoes, strange clockwork constructs often encountered in and near fallen ruins. The echoes oppose them at every turn, but as they approach the innermost sanctum, they encounter a strange lich, a twisted creature with a blue glow that is unlike the others. Once they have defeated the Lich, they discover a mysterious mural at the heart of the ruins, although only the upper part of it has been preserved, depicting some sort of winged god. While inspecting the mural, Clive has a strange experience, wherein everything else seems to stand still. In that mysterious state, he meets the hooded man, who reveals himself to be Clive himself. Clive gets transported into a hellish landscape of lava and flame, where he is forced to witness Ifrit killing Joshua once more, his younger self reminding him that their duty was to protect him. Hoping to let Joshua's soul finally rest in peace, Clive vows that no matter how bitter the truth that awaits him, he will press on, accepting the truth and taking on Ifrit as well as his own shadow finally accepting that he is the dominant of Ifrit, the second icon of fire. Clive finds a new purpose in life, to unravel the mystery of why he was chosen to bear this burden, and to live not for revenge, but to atone for the crimes he committed thirteen years ago. Jill says that they will find the answers together, as Joshua watches them from a distance. Meanwhile, in Castle Dasbog in Dalmechia, Hugo Kupka learns of Benedicta's demise 
and demands to know who is responsible. He is told that Sid paid for Benedicta's coffer, at which point Kupka becomes enraged, swearing vengeance on Sid and all he holds dear. As they return to Eastpool, they find that the villagers they just met have been brutally slaughtered for sheltering bearers. The soldiers acting under orders from Empress Annabella, Clive's mother, now ruling over Sunbreck along with the Emperor. They find Lady Hannah's corpse among the slaughtered, and Clive swears to make a world where being a bearer is not a crime punishable by death, officially deciding to cast his lot in with Sid and the others. As they head for the hideaway, a Dalmachian spy takes note, following them back to discover its secret location. At the hideaway, Clive consults with Sid about what can be done. He is reminded of how Sid once told him that he wanted to create a place where people could die on their own terms, but Clive wants to take it one step further, creating a place where people can live on their own terms. He says that most men march blindly to their end, not realizing that they too deserve a choice, and that he will not turn a blind eye to their suffering any longer. Jill takes Clive's hand, the gesture indicating that this will be the way they atone for their crimes, Sid welcoming them into their ranks. Earlier in Oriflam, the Imperial capital, the Cardinals had been discussing the spread of the Blight and how it threatens the Empire. The Black representing an immediate threat to the capital. Unimpressed by the Council's empty talk, Sylvester Lesage, the reigning Emperor, says that if it is fertile land the Empire requires, they need but look south to the Crystalline Dominion. Although one of the Cardinals reminds him that they are bound by mutual accord that the Dominion is a neutral state whose borders they are sworn to respect. The Emperor, however, does not share their insistence on respecting such treaties, ordering a war of conquest to claim new lands for the sake of the Empire and its citizenry. Leaving them to sort out the details, Sylvester takes his leave, leaving a message for his son Dion to rest and recover, for Bahamut's strength may soon be needed. Back at the hideaway, Sid shocks Clive and Jill with the revelation that the Mother Crystals are the actual reason the world is dying. As the Mother Crystals drain the land of its ether, ultimately leaving it but a blackened husk of its former self. Although hard to swallow, Clive and Jill eventually believe him, but having just signed up to help the bearers, Clive feels that destroying the crystals lies outside the scope of that calling. However, Sid says that they can't very well set their people free if they're all lying dead in a blighted ditch. So stopping the mother crystals takes priority. Together, they swear an oath to bring the old world crashing down in order to build a new one. Symbolically stabbing a set of daggers into a small crystal lying on the table as a sign of what's to come. Making their way to Oriflam, where they seek to take their first step towards true freedom by destroying Drake's head, they must first make their way through the checkpoint at Northreach. Thankfully, they have a friend of the cause living there. Their friend being the so-called Dame, the proud proprietress of Northreach's foremost house of ill repute, a brothel called the Vale who commands much respect in those parts. The dame helps Clive pass the checkpoint by having him pretend to be one of her branded, all as a favor to Sid, although she expects a favor from Clive in return. Upon fulfilling her end of the bargain, the dame then tells Clive that one of her girls, Tatiane, has gone missing and tasks him with finding her. 
Clive accepting the seal of the moon and stars so that people may know he is affiliated with the dame. Clive does as he says, all the while being reminded of the deep hatred the people of Sunbrack harbor towards bearers. But regretfully he is too late, Katian already being dead when he finds her, along with her jealous suitor, Yannick. Having done the dame's bidding, Clive rendezvous us with Sid and Jill, and together they infiltrate Oriflam. There, they use the pleasure houses to hide out as they wait for sunset, so that they can sneak in through the glass gate which leads to the mines. That night, they make good on their plans, but once inside the mines, they encounter miners and guards who have gone Akashic due to an ether flood in the mines, the men having irreversibly lost their senses due to an overexposure to ether. Clive and the others only retaining them thanks to their resistance as dominance. Using a hole left in the wall by Sid's last skirmish, wherein he was chased away by Bahamut, they reached the Mother Crystal, its gargantuan stature, leaving none left unimpressed. Entering the inner sanctum, they finally stand before the heart of the crystal, ready to become the enemies of the world, so that they may bring about a better tomorrow. In order to destroy the heart, Sid fully primes, transforming into Ramu, so that he can use the full extent of his powers to destroy it. However, the absence of the crystal leaves behind a dark abyss which attacks Sid, announcing the emergence of Typhon, a withered and wizened colossus who reaches out of the void. As this plays out, the voice inside Clive's head tells him to show his strength. But as Typhon tries to take hold of Clive, Sid throws his staff at the shriveled giant, temporarily locking him away. However, Clive is pulled into the void along with the creature, the voice in his head not leaving him alone. Before long, Typhon removes the staff, unleashing its power, forcing Clive to turn into Ifrit to take him on, although Clive still can't call on Ifrit's power freely. Clive and Typhon the Transgressor do battle, and Clive ultimately overpowers the creature, prompting the voice in his head to recognize him as a most suitable vessel. As Clive returns to the real world, he discovers Sid to be badly wounded. But before they can attempt to help him, Clive is faced with a mysterious being, the source of the voice in his head, who declares they shall now become one. Before the creature can put its hands on Clive, however, Sid stabs the creature, bringing it low. Immobilized, the creature asks with indifference why he denies his fate before disappearing into the ether. Sid starts coughing and celebrates the fact that he has one cigar left in his arsenal. Clive lights it using his fire magic, and together they share Sid's last moments together. Trusting in Clive, Sid bestows upon him the essence of Ramu, just as Clive had taken Garuda's essence, saying that the rest is in his hands. Before dying of his wounds, Sid's cigar falling to the floor, the flame still alive. With no time to rest, the enigmatic creature returns, violently assailing them with ether, at which point Joshua appears, countering its onslaught with his flames as Clive and Jill pass out. Joshua calls out to Ultima. The creature, recognizing that Joshua has learned their name, asking what else the phoenix has learned about them. Joshua says that his travels have revealed much about him and his ambitions, and that it was Ultima who tore him from his brother to obtain Clive's power. However, Joshua says that Ultima will have to go through him if he wants Clive, ultimately trapping Ultima within himself, using the power of the phoenix to keep him at bay, and healing the wounds brought on by Ultima's imprisonment. As the Mother Crystal overlooking Sunbreck evaporates, 
the populace stares helplessly in horror at what is happening. Meanwhile at the hideaway, Dalmechian soldiers slaughter everyone they can find as they look for Sid under orders from Kupka. Gav losing an eye in the confrontation with a Dalmechian spy who ratted them out. Suddenly, Titan emerges and crushes the hideaway, destroying Sid's precious sanctuary to get back at him for the death of Benedicta. Five years later, in the year of the realm 878, Clive and Jill go undercover in the streets of Kosnis in the Dalmechian Republic. There, an orphan girl named Kiel offers to sell Jill a curative to ease the aches of the road, but she declines the offer. Later, a man welcomes Clive, calling him Sid, and tells him that bearers have been locked up in an old courthouse on the edge of town, guarded by Kupka's private guard. Clive and Jill go to free them, but even after they set them free of their bonds, the bearers are less than grateful, telling them that they never asked to be saved, their friends being dead, because they were used to lure them there. The bearers refused their help, and Clive and Jill return without them. Having destroyed their symbol of hope five years ago, for reasons they'll never know, Clive recognizes that they can't blame them for thinking them to be the cause of their misery. For though it is to give them a better tomorrow, they see only that which makes their lives harder today. Jill wonders whether they made the right choice. But Clive believes that when Sid said he wanted to create a world where they were free, it didn't matter whether the choice they made was right or wrong, only that it was their own. Clive has taken on Sid's name to carry on his legacy, now being known to many as Sid the Outlaw. As they reach the new hideaway, in the center of Lake Benomir, in the deadlands of Central Storm, Clive reports to Otto, chief steward of the hideaway, telling him about what transpired in Kosnis. He then goes to see Vivian Ninetales, a scholar and strategist hailing from the Crystalline Dominion, who apprises him of the current state of the realm, reminding him of how Sandbrek has now subjugated her homeland. Next he pays Hippocrates a visit, the hideaway's resident historian, to see whether his research has yielded any mentions of Ultima, but the lawsman has yet to find anything of note. As Clive runs into Tarja, she compliments his scar, Tarja having been the one to surgically remove the brand he bore, allowing him to walk around without being persecuted. He then finds a letter from Gav, telling him that the Republican army is on the march, leaving Randela, Dalmechia's capital, in Kupka's charge. This leaves Kupka less time to trouble them, offering them a chance to continue reading the world of the Mother Crystals. Meanwhile in the Northern Territories, Joshua travels along with his ever-faithful escort, both of them noting the alarming spread of the Blight and how it threatens the very existence of the Twin Realms, the world marching ever closer to its end. The hideaway receives word that Martha has gone missing, so Clive and Jill travel to Martha's rest, where they discover she's been taken away in shackles, the Imperials leading her towards Sorrowwise Bay to the abbey sheltering the bearers. Clive and Jill give pursuit and find Martha along the way. Distraught, Martha tells them that knights calling themselves the Black Shields have come to call the bearers. Martha having been saved by the sacrifice of the bearers she had taken in to help. Clive and Jill go to the abbey where they find the bearers murdered in cold blood. They then encounter the Black Shields, a twisted play on words by Clive's mother, as she mocks the once proud shields of Rosaria. The Black Shields even reciting the oath of the former Shields of Rosaria. Enraged by this perversion of what he holds dear, Clive faces the knights in battle, slaying every last one of them. Returning to the hideaway, Clive devises a plan, along with his conspirators, to finally make a move on the Mother Crystals. 
His plan entails using the war between Dalmachia and Sandbrek over the Crystalline Dominion as a diversion. Their first target being Drake's Breath in the Iron Kingdom, since no one would suspect it. Clive and Jill set out for Port Isolt to hopefully secure a ship which can carry them across the strait from Clive's uncle, Byron Rosfield, Elwyn's younger brother and successful merchant. On the way there, Jill explains to Clive that just as he faced his past at Phoenix Gate, returning to Ironholm will be her chance to face what she has done, Clive telling her that they will face it together. With a path to Port Isolt blocked, Clive and Jill seek out secret tunnels in the Lazarus district situated just outside the eastern edge of the port. There they encounter Sir Wade, leading the Guardians of the Flame, a gathering of shields devoted to resisting the Empire's influence in Rosaria. Together with Wade, they confront the Black Shields once more, this time at Buid Bridge, hoping to put an end to the atrocities committed in the Mon's proud name of the Shields. Their plan works, and they manage to stop the Cullings for the time being. Although Empress Annabella is sure to move swiftly to see her minion's ranks replenished. Before bidding farewell to Wade, he tells them that their operation has long since been secretly funded by Lord Byron, warning them he may refuse them an audience since he must remain ever vigilant, especially since Clive is famously dead. As Clive and Jill pay Byron a visit at Rosfield Manor, he greets them with an axe, unwilling to let anyone soil the memory of his late nephew. However, Clive proves his identity by performing the part of Sir Crandall of Camelot from The Saint and the Sectary, a beloved Ballastean fable, his heartfelt performance convincing Byron that he is in fact telling the truth about who he is. Byron joins him in the act, playing the part of Madhu, earning him applause from Clive. Byron bursts into tears, welcoming his dear nephew back from the dead. Byron then outfits Clive and Jill with a ship that bears them across to the island of Drustanus in the Iron Kingdom, where Drake's breath rises from the boiling sea. Before they set out, however, the two of them return to the hideaway to complete their final preparations, to bring down not only the Mother Crystal, but also the Patriarch, Imrian, who enslaved Jill and forced her to kill for his kingdom. Separating from the ship, Clive and Jill land their dinghy upon the shores of Drustanus and make for the mountain and the crystal's heart that lies within, where both the Mother Crystal and the Patriarch shall taste their blades. Inside Mount Drustanus, they come across a torrent of lava blocking their path, but thankfully Jill is able to use her powers as Shiva to shield them momentarily as they cross the bridge. On their way to the heart, they pass by the Handmaiden's living quarters, where Jill is reunited with Lady Marle, a Rosarian who took Jill under her wing. Jill tells her of their plans and instructs her to flee the island before they carry out their mission. Bidding farewell to Lady Marley, Clive and Jill find their way to the heart of the Mother Crystal, where Imrian is leading a prayer, performing sacrifices in the name of the crystal. Jill shouts out to him, declaring her presence, admonishing him for the lives he has taken and for the things he made her do. In his self-righteousness, Imrian claims that the lives he took were sullied by the stain of ether, and that he simply cleansed them of their corruption. But Jill will have none of it, cursing him for his sins and herself for playing the part of his monster for far too long. Baring her teeth at her former master, Jill says that just as she was once forced to bow to him, he will now bow to her. As Clive and Jill start fighting Imrian's disciples, the mysterious hooded figure Clive has seen many times waves its hand before disappearing leading lava to pour from the Mother Crystal, summoning a fiend of fire. This forces Jill to fully prime into Shiva, but as Clive attempts to call on the power of Ifrit, 
he fails to manifest the icon at will. Once primed, Jill holds the fiend at bay, allowing Clive to fight it encircled by a wall of icicles. With their combined powers, Clive and Jill defeat the liquid flame, although it leaves Jill too weak to even stand. Jill imbues Clive's blade with ice, allowing him to strike at the Mother Crystal's heart, shattering it in Sid's honor. All the while, Imrian stares in disbelief, mortified by what has happened. Jill tells him that they have destroyed his precious Mother Crystal, before running him through with her sword, killing the true monster. As the crystal dissipates, the inhabitants of the island flee, Lady Marley being among them as she prays for Jill's safety as the last light of the crystal fades. Meanwhile in the Crystal Land Dominion, Joshua suddenly feels Ultima's thoughts turning to Clive, forcing him to catch his breath as he struggles to contain him. Keel, the young girl who had previously offered to sell medicine to Jill and Delmechia, appears and offers to help Joshua. But Joshua tells her to save her medicine for those who need them the most. Joshua wonders why Clive is in Ultima's thoughts again after five years of silence, noting that he can't keep him sealed away much longer. Joshua's retainer asks what he hopes to find in the Dominion, and Joshua replies that he seeks Dion Lesage, the crown prince of Sunbrek, having much to tell him, believing him to be a righteous man. Yet elsewhere in the Dalmachian Republic, the Ministry of Law discusses the dire state of the war effort as they try to combat the Empire's illegitimate claim on the Dominion. However, Kupka, permanent economic advisor to the Dalmachian government, thanks to his role as Titan, scolds them for having been goaded into a war without any thought as to the chaos it might reap. Their soldiers now starving as they await their orders. One amongst the ministry says that Kupka could end this if he'd only take to the field, but Kupka retorts that if he were to do that, and so would Bahamut, their duel shaking the island to its foundations, dooming the dominion as opposed to liberating it. Suddenly, the meeting is joined by Empress Annabella and her son, Olivier Lesage, the half-brother of Dion, as well as Clive and Joshua. They have been summoned here by none other than Kupka, deeply offending the Ministry, as it means that Kupka has been in contact with the enemy. Once in private, Kupka and Annabella discuss the reason he has called her, Kupka revealing to her that Sid the Outlaw's true identity is that of her son, Clive. Annabella refuses to acknowledge the accusation, but Kupka says that he will take care of her son as long as she will see to it that the hostilities between Dalmachia and Sandbrek are allowed to cease. As Kupka leaves, hell-bent on exacting revenge for Benedicta, Annabella remains in the room, reminding Olivier that he will one day become the Emperor of Sandbrek. Back at the hideaway, Tarja finished giving Jill an examination, telling Clive that the curse has spread as Sheba has exacted her toll. As he sits down beside her, their hands accidentally touch, and their lips draw ever closer. Before they can kiss, however, they are interrupted by Gav, who tells them that Rosaria has come under attack by the Men of the Rock from Drake's Fang, Hugo Kupka's private guard, who hopes to lure Clive to Rosalith to exact his revenge on Sid. Knowing full well it's a trap meant to draw him out, Clive, Jill, and Gav travel to Rosalith, arriving as Kupka and his men have already breached the castle's outer wall. Clive and Jill make their way to the castle, where they fall right into Kupka's trap, leading Jill to be captured by Kupka. Jill is placed in bindings, which keep her from using her powers, and Clive is forced to lower his weapon to stay Kupka's hand from killing her. Clive is then taken into custody and forced to wear the same bindings, Torgal being the only one to escape the confrontation, along with Gav, who is scouting the area. Gav breaks Clive out of his cell and releases his bindings, 
allowing them to rush to Jill's rescue just as she is being executed. However, it is not them who save her, but rather Torgal, who manifests a dormant power within, turning him into something akin to an icon. Having freed Jill, they all come together to take care of Kupka's men in the courtyard, before Clive enters the castle alone to face him, the others watching his back. Inside, Clive learns of the reason behind Kupka's vendetta against Sid, Kupka believing that Sid was the one to kill his dear Benedicta. Kupka was disappointed to hear that Sid had already perished, but relieved to learn that Clive has taken up his name. Kupka deciding that as Clive chooses to bear that murderer's name, he shall answer for his crimes. Upon hearing this, Clive says that the only crimes he'll answer for are his own, revealing to Kupka that it was in fact he himself who slew Benedicta Harman, not Sid, meaning that the object of Kupka's vengeance is standing right in front of him. Kupka celebrates Clive's confession, becoming enraged as he tells Clive that he and Benedicta shared a dream of him becoming king of the world, of her becoming his queen, ruling together as the gods they are. But Clive refuses to show him any pity for all the lives he's taken and no mercy. They fight as the castle crumbles around them, the power of the earth nourishing Kupka's strength as he shatters the floor, crashing them down into the Rossfield catacombs. But even with Kupka in his earthly element, Clive manages to beat him back, cutting off his hands as he returns to human form. However, as he goes in for the kill, Titan's essence seeps into Clive, rendering him too weak to finish the job. As Kupka tries to take advantage of Clive's disadvantaged state, he is spirited away by a mysterious man who refers to Clive as Mythos before taking his leave. As Clive exits the castle, the others finish up fighting off a group of eluders. Clive surmising that the man who took Kupka away must also have been from Malud. Back at the hideout, Tarja orders Jill to rest, and as Clive speaks to Otto, they are joined by Mid, whose full name is Midadol Telamon, as she is Sid's daughter. She has come to the hideaway since Kupka's little stunt in Rosaria put a damper on her studies, and she plans to stay a while. Mid asks Clive to help her fashion a workshop for her like the one she had at her dad's place believing she can be of help to them. Having made all the necessary arrangements for Mid's workshop and enlisted the help of Bernard the Carpenter once more, Clive goes to meet Gav and Harpocrates. There, they learn that Torgal is a rare breed of frost wolf native to the northern reaches of Alistea. As Harpocrates tells them the story of an ancient frost wolf called Fendrit, who served a queen in the north and could command magic. He surmises that it is likely that the queen was a dominant of Shiva, much like Jill. Jill possibly having unlocked Torgal's dormant powers, as Torgal grew up as her faithful companion. His powers having awakened just when his master needed him the most. The transformation appears to have given Torgal quite the appetite, as Hippocrates found him earlier with his nose buried in his nuts. As the workshop is ready, Mid promises to work her fingers to the bone to pay the people of the hideaway back, Clive looking forward to seeing what she will cook up. In the crystalline dominion, seat of the imperial court, the cardinals of Sunbrek convene once again, notifying the emperor that the Dalmechian government now sues for peace. They thank Olivier for starting peace talks with the mighty Titan as the still young boy cuddles his mother's lap. However, the Emperor plans to betray the Dalmex by keeping peace talks open all the while plotting to destroy them with Bahamut's power. He notes that Kupka is otherwise engaged, meaning that he couldn't take to the field even if the Dalmex were to send for him. Eon raises his voice to his father in protest, worrying for the citizens of Sunbrek, but his father says that for every citizen who falls, another can be bred. Much like for every home that burns, another can be built. 
the only thing that matters being the preservation of the Empire. The Emperor gives Dion a white flower, symbolizing the Empire, and tells him to prepare for battle, Dion heeding his command with great reservations. As Dion leaves, the Emperor receives a message that the astrologers have seen the shadow of treachery hanging over Prince Dion, confirming Annabella's tales. Back at the hideaway, Clive is visited by his uncle Byron, who has come to learn more about their cause and to lend them a hand, telling them of a fleet sailing south past Port Isolde. Upon hearing of this fleet, Vivian surmises that the royalists have taken Kupka back to Drake's Fang, a place rich enough in ether to conjure the magics needed to mend his hurts. As Clive sets out for Drake's Fang to take Kupka's head, he is accompanied by Byron a part of the way. Along the way they stop at the Dalamil Inn for a drink, where they are accosted by royalists, all the while unaware that Joshua and his retainer are resting at the very same inn. Leaving the fighting to Clive, Byron jumps behind the bar, finishing his meal as Clive takes care of the rest. As the fight breaks out, Joshua and his retainer make themselves scarce to avoid trouble. But as the phoenix feather Clive has in his possession begins to burn, he rushes up the stairs looking for his brother. But alas, he is too late. He discovers that the road to Drake's Fang is closed by order of Lord Kupka. So in order to pass, they seek the help of the desert hare, Rosanna Dalimil, a woman of mystery that had worked with a former saint. Thanks to Byron's guile, they manage to locate her, only to discover she is in fact a young man named Lubor. In order to prove themselves to Lubor, they take care of Dalimil's troubles by retrieving crystals pilfered by the men of the rock that were meant for the common folk. Subsequently, Lubor gives Clive the seal of the Desert Rose, so that any friend of his will be a friend of Clive's, allowing them passage to the south. As Clive bids farewell to Byron, Byron asks for forgiveness for having failed Rosaria, telling Clive that he must take his father's place as its leader. However, Clive says that he cannot lead Rosaria, since he now fights to build a new world where men may live and die on their own terms, telling Byron that even though he won't reclaim Rosaria, he will nevertheless follow in his father's footsteps, carrying the torch kindled by him as he sought to relieve bearers of their plight, extending it not only to Rosaria, but to all of Alistheia. Inside Castle Dasbok, Kupka laments the loss of his hands, enraged by how Clive has disabled him. He is joined by Harbard, Walud's Lord Commander, who asks him to calm down, he being the man who carried Kupka out of Rosaria. Harbard says that Kupka is weak, but there might yet be a way for him to take his revenge, telling him to seek the blessing of the heart of the Mother Crystal, allowing him to conjure his icon even after Clive took it from him, just like Benedicta had done, she too having drunk of the ether. Once alone, Clive enters the crystal mines of Drake's Fang without encountering a single Republican guard, or at least none that has survived the incursion of orcs ferried over from Walud, who have slain and satiated their hunger for flesh upon their allies. Clive presses on to Castle Dasbok, Kupka having built his castle inside the dome of the same mountain that houses the crystal. All the while, Harbard watches with great interest as Clive fights his way through. Reaching the heart, Clive discovers Kupka ensnared by an illusion of Benedicta, promising to never part from her again. As an illusion of Clive threatens her, Kupka then finds the ability to prime again, forcing Clive to call on Ifrit, the icon of fire answering his call this time. As Kupka turns into Titan, he regains his hands, allowing him to fight Ifrit at full strength leading to a battle of epic proportions. Backed into a corner, Kupka starts feeding on crystals, turning him into Titan Lost, a titan among titans, Ifrit being only a small insect in comparison. Regardless of the differences in stature, however, Clive manages to fell the icon, 
plunging it underground, where Clive draws on ether from the Mother Crystal, just like Kupka had done, giving him the strength needed to slay him. Afterwards, Clive destroys the heart of the Mother Crystal, causing him to have a vision of Ultima, who tells him that Clive's strength is growing, bringing him closer to perfection, all the while referring to him as Mythos. Ultima tries to take over Clive's body, saying he was created for this purpose, but Clive pushes him away as he hears Joshua's voice telling him not to let him in. Upon being resisted, Ultima says that in order to make Clive stop resisting them as their vessel, they must first sever every thread of consciousness which supports his will. Ultima then disappears, contemplating their next move. On a cliff overlooking Drake's Fang, Harbert and Barnabas look on from a distance, calling Kupka a fool as they watch the Mother Crystal dissipate. Elsewhere, Dion is still perplexed that his father plots to betray the Dalmex, even as he has entered into peace talks with them. Dion and Terence share a kiss, Dion wishing that Terence were his master so that he would not have to carry out this atrocity, leading to the deaths of thousands. Suddenly, Dion receives a message from the capital, telling him that Olivier has been made emperor. Dion being told to maintain his position. However, perplexed by these developments, Dion feels compelled to go to the palace. But before he can set off, he is visited by Joshua, who says he has a tale to tell him. Clive returns to the hideaway and sets about spreading the glad tidings that Kupka, the man who crushed their former home and slaughtered many of their friends, is no more. Clive also plans to pay a visit to Sid's grave, telling him the news. But as he invites Mid to come along with him, she says she is too busy, working on the Enterprise, a ship designed by her and Sid that runs on mithril engines instead of the fickle whims of the winds. After Clive helps her to acquire what she needs, Mid agrees to finally pay her old man a visit. Before they head to Sid's grave, however, Mid runs off, not being one for such things. At the grave, Clive tells Sid of Kupka's fate, telling him that the shadow which loomed over them is no longer. The members of the hideaway pay their respects to Sid, reaffirming their vow to change the world. And now, with only a single mother crystal remaining in Storm, Drake's tail in the Crystalline Dominion. Clive and Jill set out to breach the borders of the Dominion and infiltrate the capital, Twinside. In the seat of the Imperial Court in Twinside, Dion returns to learn that the reports of his father surrendering his throne to Olivier are true, the former Emperor telling him that Emperor Olivier will rebuild the Holy Empire of San Brec. Sylvester says that with Kupka gone, the Empire will seize the lands of the Republic, and that soon its flag will fly over the entirety of Valisthea. Dion tells him that he finds his father much changed, asking whether these are truly his ambitions, or whether they are perhaps the ambitions of Ultima. His father says that it is all thanks to Annabella for reminding him of certain truths regarding the nature of nations, of rulers, and of the divine. Dion becomes enraged at Annabella, calling her the traitoress who slew her husband and forsook her homeland, but his father will not have it. As the former emperor and Olivier leave for a meeting, Dion and Annabella are left alone, giving Annabella the chance to admonish the prince for being of low birth in the guise of a compliment, reminding him that his impure blood will not be allowed to stain the throne, no matter his accomplishments. In order to cross over to the Dominion, Clive and Jill require a trader's pass to get through the checkpoint in Boklad, but Goots, who joined them along for the ride, had his stolen by a pickpocket. Thankfully, he has a friend in Boklad who might be able to help. 
So they seek out Eloise, the owner of the Crimson Caravan. Eloise tells them that traders' passes have become a much sought-after commodity due to the heavily enforced checkpoints, robbing honest merchants of their livelihood. Eloise asks Clive to catch whoever is behind it all and help them ensure that no more passes are stolen, slaying two birds with a single stone. As they try to get to the bottom of who is making children steal passes, they are mistaken for the ne'er-do-wells themselves by Theodore, Eloise's brother, who is looking for the same answers they are. However, recognizing Goots, Theodore realizes they are on the same side. Joining hands, they seek out the cast stones, who have been collecting passes, and crush their operation, ridding Bockland of their criminal activity once and for all, winning back their pass and allowing them to continue their journey. Before they leave, however, Eloise recognizes Clive as Sid the Outlaw, telling him that they are on his side, earning the hideaway yet another ally of influence. In the Crystalline Dominion, Joshua asks Dion whether he is sure that his father has no knowledge of Ultima. Dion believing that he is not under Ultima's influence, even though some sinister force has come to exert an influence over Sun Brick. Dion believes Joshua's tale that there is an evil afoot in Malastea, but tells him he cannot help him until he has first taken care of things at home. He is reminded of his encounter with Annabella, as she called his blood wholly unworthy of the highest office of state, as she has discovered that Dion is the son of a whore, making him impure in her eyes. At the time, Dion asks whether she was threatening his father with his information, but she tells him that she has simply been whispering in his ear through the astrologers, telling him that his mongrel son is plotting a rebellion. Dion curses her for feeding his father lies, but she says that if he behaves, Emperor Olivier may still find use for him. As she leaves, Annabella stomps on Sunbreck's sacred white flower, just as she has disrespected the Holy Empire with her schemes. Continuing his talk with Joshua, Dion recognizes that Annabella is a darkness in Sunbreck whose grip must be released. Once that is done, however, what strength he has will be given to Joshua's cause, telling him that one day they will take to the skies together to bring a new dawn to Valestea. As Joshua leaves, Dion asks Terence whether he believes what he's about to do is wrong, and Terence replies that the dragoons have but one leader, following him until the very end. Reassured, Dion decrees that for their crimes against the crown, the traitorous Annabella and her usurping son shall be put to death to restore the empire. As Clive and Jill arrive in Twinside, they try to think of a way to create a distraction for them to reach the Mother Crystal. However, someone does their work for them, as the night air rings out with the sounds of explosions in the city. Taking advantage of the confusion, Clive, Jill, and Torgal climb the rooftops, making their way to the Mother Crystal. Along the way, they discover that the city is under siege by none other than the Dragoons themselves, being forced to fight one of their pet white dragons. As they are reunited with Goots, the Mother Crystal's heart starts burning bright, and as Dion arrives on the scene in the form of Bahamut, he starts to indiscriminately rain death upon the city. When Joshua sees this, he believes that something has happened to his highness and rushes to stop him, still believing him to be a good man. Using his power as Bahamut, Dion wounds the heart of the Mother Crystal, causing Drake's tail to disappear. However, a new crystal formation sprouts up at its place, shielding the heart. As Clive and the others make for Drake's tail, they see the Phoenix flying into action to stop Bahamut. Clive rushing to his brother's aid, though his brother cannot hear him. On the way to the heart, they have to fight Ultima's death-like thralls, and as they climb through one of the buildings, 
they happen upon a distraught Annabella holding on to Olivier for dear life. Reunited with his mother, Clive demands that she answer why she betrayed Rosaria, Annabella replying that someone had to protect the noble blood of the land's sovereigns, for as long as a noble bloodline remains unbroken, a fallen nation can always be replaced. By betraying Rosaria, she sold her country for a son of the noblest blood, joining her line with the Lesages to birth a savior, blessed by both Bahamut and the Phoenix. Annabella curses Clive for not having been chosen by the Phoenix, wishing that Clive would have died instead of Joshua. Clive then tells her to look out the window, to see that Joshua is there, that the Phoenix lives on, battling Bahamut as they speak. Before she can ascertain the truth with her own eyes, the phoenix comes crashing through the wall, transforming back into Joshua. Clive rushes to his brother's side, holding him in his arms. He then passes him on to Jill, before shielding them from Bahamut's wrath by turning into a freet, taking on the rampaging Warden of Light. As the two do battle, the new crystal blossoms like a flower, the insides becoming their battlefield. As Bahamut pins Ifrit down, he is stopped by the phoenix as he leaps back into the fray, the two brothers banding together against Bahamut. Joshua fights Bahamut in the sky, but as they return to the bosom of the mother crystal, Bahamut drinks of the ether, becoming more powerful than ever. Clive and Joshua then combine their powers, merging Ifrit and phoenix into a single form, that of Ifrit risen, taking the battle into space. And as Bahamut threatens to burn the world, the brothers counter him with all their might, defeating the Lord of Dragons. And as Dion falls out of the sky, Joshua catches him. All the while, Clive destroys the Mother Crystal, which has now been released from Bahamut's clutches. Back on the ground, the brothers finally savor their reunion. The foursome finally back together, as they are joined by Jill and Torgal. As Dion awakens, he sees Ultima standing beside Annabella, where Olivier would otherwise be expected to stand, lunging his spear at him, making Olivier disappear into the ether, much to Annabella's dismay. Dion sees a vision of his father, telling him that the demon who would tear their house apart is no more, before losing consciousness. Joshua runs to Dion's side to save him, despite all that has happened. However, as he heals him, Bahamut's essence flows into Clive, granting him the power of yet another icon. Upon being confronted with his essence, Clive has a vision of Dion confronting his father after the dragoons started their attacks, his father jumping in front of Dion's spear as he aimed it at Olivier, Dion accidentally killing his father. Olivier then stepped forward, telling him that Mythos approaches, magically driving Dion into the frenzy that caused him to do so much damage to the city and its people. As Clive returns, Joshua asks his mother to come with him, but she lunges at him with a knife, saying all of this is but a bad dream, calling Joshua a shadow that will not claim her. Instead, she slits her own throat, ending her own life. As the Mother Crystal crumbles, Joshua carries his allies away upon the Phoenix's wings, away from the smoldering ruins of the Crystalline Dominion, taking them home to the hideaway. As Ultima watches on, they cast Primogenesis, which unbalances the world's ether so that a new age of reason may begin. Some time later, in the royal bedchamber of Walud, Barnabas talks to a vision of Benedicta, who then transforms into Kupka, before taking on the form of Ultima, his master, who tells him that soon Mythos shall become their perfect vessel. Before that can happen, however, his bonds with the others must first be cut, Primogenesis being the way to achieve this end, as mankind will surrender to the ether. Ultima tasks Barnabas with finding Mythos and severing his bonds so that new ones won't take their place, there being nothing Odin's black blade cannot cut. 
Ultima then turns into Barnabas' mother, welcoming him into her embrace. Returning to the hideaway, what should have been their happy reunion is overshadowed by the rolling clouds that are spread across the realm as a result of primogenesis, driving all who wallow beneath them to desperation and despair. With the land in disarray, Clive must lend their allies a hand, taking care of scores of Akashic at Martha's Rest, Ultima's thralls at Northreach, and bandits and Dalamil, although these small acts only postpone the inevitable. When given the chance, they go talk with Joshua in the infirmary, who tells them that Ultima will stop at nothing to get Clive, even if it means toppling an empire, although the reason as to why still eludes him. All he knows is that Clive was chosen for a reason, since his special abilities seem to allow him to possess more than the might of a single icon or element, his potential for growth being nigh limitless. The reason Ultima hasn't already claimed him is that the two of them are somehow still incompatible, his mind not being properly attuned to Clive's body. Joshua then tells him that a piece of Ultima is inside of him, but that he can't contain him forever. Suddenly they catch wind that Canva, capital of the Free Cities, is under siege by an army of Akashic. Gav, Byron and Mid hiding out in the city, where the Enterprise has been built. In order to help them and the people of the city, Clive, Jill and Torgal travel through Tabor to reach Canva, joined by Joshua, who has business there. In Tabor, Joshua is reunited with his escort, who introduces herself as Yote, a knight of the Undying, charged with the protection of Joshua Rosfield, keeper of the Flame of the Phoenix, the Undying being loyal servants to the Ducal Throne, having served it for generations from the Shadow. It was the Undying who saved Joshua after the events of Phoenix Gate, Yote having been Joshua's constant companion and protector since he left Rosaria. Clive thanks her for saving his brother, and Yote then tells them what she knows about recent events, leading them to deduce that it's the ship Einherjar which has laid siege to Canva at the behest of King Barnabas. Meanwhile in Canva, Barnabas and Harbert interrupt a council meeting as the council members discuss what has befallen the city. One of the council members believes that the king has come to save them from the Akashic, but with one decisive swing of his black blade, Barnabas slaughters everyone in the room in one fell swoop. Barnabas says that Sid's daughter is still in the city, a consciousness to which Mythos is inextricably bound and inexorably drawn, she being the law which will bring him to them. Back in Tabor, Yote shows them a tapestry, depicting the same image as the mural they witnessed in Phoenix Gate. Joshua telling them, It is the remains of an ancient faith lost to history. He believes it may be the key to discerning Ultima's purpose, believing the figure in the center to be Ultima, ruling over the icons, Barnabas having accepted this subservient role willingly. Joshua tells Yote that he will accompany his brother to Canva, telling her to instead go to the hideaway. As they approach Canva, smoke is already rising from the city, but as they make their way through, they are reunited with Gav, Byron and Mid, Byron being taken aback at the sight of his second nephew now returned from the dead. They tell them that the Akashic are somehow being controlled, unified for a single purpose instead of just rampaging randomly. As Clive hopes to save those they can, he sends Joshua and Jill across the river, while he himself heads for the merchant's district. All the while Mid and the others are to prepare the Enterprise to set sail. Clive meets Harbert, who addresses him as Mythos, telling him that the Akashic Clive pities are pure and divine. He then reveals his full name, that of Sleipnir of House Harbert. As he engages Clive in battle, using his master's weapon, Gungnir, to fight him. As he is bested by Clive, Sleipnir claims the vessel is strong, before dropping down dead. Clive is then joined by Joshua and Jill, as well as Barnabas, who strikes down an entire building before greeting them. Barnabas and Clive cross swords, 
Barnabas clearly showing his dominance, even though he expected more of the man who bested his lord commander. Barnabas keeps referring to Clive as Mythos, telling him it is his purpose to surrender his mind and body to Ultima, his path to greatness only being barred by his illusion of free will. Summoning his black blade, Barnabas cuts Clive down, forcing Joshua to make off with him as Jill transforms into Shiva to cover their escape, only to also suffer the king's blade. At the ironworks, a fully functioning shipyard nestled within the hollow of a sea grotto on the outskirts of Canva, they tend to Clive's wounds. Joshua noting that even though Barnabas did great harm to Clive, he made sure the wound wasn't fatal. They tell Clive that Jill never made it back, but as he and Joshua both sense that Shiva's dominant still lives, they decide to keep hope alive. Using Sid's old writings to guide them, they finish outfitting the Enterprise, allowing them passage to Walud, so that they might save Jill. However, as they set sail, they are attacked by a horde of Akashic, led by Slipnit back from the dead, who reveals himself to be an etheric conjuration of Odin's, this time appearing in multitudes, much like Garuda's creations. Clive buys mid-time to get the ship out of the harbor, only jumping on at the last minute as they set sail for the Naldea Narrow, the strait between the continents of Storm and Ash, to chase after the Einherjar, the ship where Jill is being held. Meanwhile, Dion returns to Twinside, even though his wounds have been fully healed. Witnessing firsthand the destruction he has wrought, the banner of Sunbrack lying amidst the rubble, he loses his strength and falls to the ground. As they reach the Einherjar, Barnabas is already expecting them, lamenting how he hasn't been able to cut Clive's ties with his loved ones, each strike only serving to strengthen their bonds. Boarding the Einherjar, Clive succeeds in freeing Jill as Joshua holds Barnabas back. But Barnabas cleaves the very sea itself in two, the Einherjar falling to the bottom along with Clive, Jill, and Torgal. At the ocean floor, Barnabas appears before them again, once again cutting Clive down to size. With Clive unable to fight any longer, Barnabas tells Clive that the Dominants are the breath of the Creator and that they carry his light so that they might guide the masses in his name. But seeing as mere men are unfit to wield such power, it breaks them, unmakes them, that its immaculate aspect might reveal itself. The Icon, a power even too much for the Creator's chosen few. Apart from Mythos, whose body doesn't pay the price of power. The Dominants were created so that Mythos might drink of their strength and fulfill his divine purpose. Barnabas believes that mankind becoming Akashic will finally allow them to serve as loyal servants to their god, leading mankind back to a time when they weren't burdened by their wills, allowing them to finally know salvation. As the sea begins to cave in on itself, Barnabas disappears, and Jill freezes a path which allows them to make a run for it, reaching Ash's shores on foot. There, Clive and Jill share a tender moment, naked at a campfire. Their backs turn to one another as Torgal gets some shut-eye, giving them some privacy. Clive worries that each time he uses the flame, he burns away who he is. But Jill says that all that matters is how he chooses to use his power urging him to think of all the people he has saved. She embraces him from behind. Jill tells him that in his bid to save everyone, he has forgotten to save himself. She takes his hand in hers, telling him that she will give him what he needs to protect them all, Shiva's essence entering Clive. Embracing Jill, Clive kisses her hand, promising they will find a way to save each other so that they might look upon the moon again, together. Overjoyed in each other's arms, they share a kiss and each other's company, the moon gazing back at them.
In a nameless slum in the Crystalline Dominion, Dion is nursed back to health by Keel, who offers him fresh water as he awakens. As lanterns float on the water's surface outside the window, the girl tells Dion that her grandmother used to say that spirits sometimes get lost, and that the lanterns are there to guide them to their proper place. Dion watching on as the aftermath of his rampage floats down the river. He wonders whether it was Ultima who guided his hand as he committed his crime, but ultimately decides that his actions are his own sin to atone for. Returning to the hideaway to prepare, Joshua tells Clive that he must accompany him to Walud in search of answers about the origins of Ultima, believing they might be found in an ancient temple still standing there. As they return to Ash, Jill is tasked with guarding the ship while Clive and Joshua go alone, Gav scouting the area ahead. Once the brothers are alone, Joshua asks whether Clive absorbed Jill's icon, and as he admits to it, Joshua hits him, scolding his brother for always going it alone instead of relying on their help. The brothers reconcile, but Joshua bids Clive remember that he is not alone and that they will fight together. Reaching an ancient stronghold, Clive and Joshua split up as Joshua tries to unearth the mysteries of Ultima. On the way to Stonehill, the capital of Walud, Clive and Gav run into Odin in the village of Isla, who tells Clive that his master awaits his arrival in the capital, although he cannot be allowed to meet him in his present state. Barnabas summons the Glazeheim Wall, a vast ethereal dome, as gigantic spears descend from the sky, creating a barrier around the stone here. Stopping Clive from reaching Ultima before facing him, Barnabas vows to make his master's present presentable. Looking for a way to break the barrier, Clive and Gav run into Etta, a pregnant woman who still hasn't lost her senses. Etta tells them how everyone went mad in the village, being drawn east to the Tower of Reverie. The only reason Etta hasn't changed, likely being that she is pregnant with a bearer, the unborn baby protecting her from the malicious influence of the ether. Back at the stronghold, Joshua discovers yet another mural depicting the same scene. Only this one is complete, featuring every icon. Garuda, Ramu, Shiva, Titan, Bahamut, Odin, even Leviathan the Lost. But as he searches for the phoenix, he realizes that the figure at the top of the mural is none other than Ifrit Risen, the combined form of Ifrit and the phoenix, this being Ultima's desired vessel. Leaving Gav with Etta, Clive heads to the tower alone with Torgal, the dark spire menacingly piercing the sky. Entering Reverie, Clive ascends its heights, facing numerous echoes on his way to an audience with the Last King. At the top, Clive faces Barnabas, who has just butchered his own men to keep the edge of his blade sharp. Clive tells Barnabas that he refuses to become a puppet, instead choosing to live as a man. But Barnabas says that servitude is man's only road to salvation. The two fight, their ideals informing their blades as they clash not as icons, but as men. As the fight progresses, they take on their iconic forms. Clive meeting the king's dark blade head-on and at full power, finally besting him after having suffered defeat at his hands twice before. Odin's long becalmed heart begins to stir in the face of Clive's forceful defiance, filling it with a joy he says he hasn't known for generations. Taking self-indulgent pleasure in that battle, Barnabas presses the attack, ultimately being defeated by Clive, proving the power of human will. Dealing the finishing blow, Clive stands victorious. But before he leaves, Barnabas imbues him with the essence of Odin, finally making him presentable in the eyes of his master. Clive being unable to refuse his gift. With his dying breath, Barnabas tells his mother that he is coming home, before disappearing into the ether. Ultima's voice echoes within Clive's mind 
formally inviting him to meet them at the back of the first worm, Drake's spine, the last mother crystal, where all shall end and begin again. With Barnabas no more, Odin's barrier is lifted, allowing passage to Stonehill. Meanwhile in Randela, the city burns as the Akashic run amok, Byron barely escaping with his life as he seeks the aid of Eugene Havel, the former marshal. Together they fight off the Akashic, as Byron enlists his aid to Clive's cause, although they might not survive their current encounter. Thankfully they are joined by Dion, fully recovered, who rallies his dragoons to their cause, creating a combined force. He tasks Terence with finding the girl who saved his life, asking the deceased to it that she is provided for, simultaneously paying his debt to the girl and keeping his love, Terence, away from the front lines. The finality of the order weighing heavy on Terence. Sometime later in Eistla, Gav takes Etta to the Hylaway, as the brothers make for the capital to face Ultima. Joshua tells Clive that Ultima desires their combined form, Ifrit Risen, as his vessel, since there is something his immaterial form cannot achieve, something that requires an unthinkable amount of ether. Joshua surmises that Ultima plans to cast a spell a thousand years in the making using the Mother Crystals. Therefore, setting their sights on the Mother Crystal, they seek to destroy the last one to foil Ultima's plans, whatever they may be. Reaching the walls of Stonehir, they are greeted with a fallen kingdom, and a behemoth who denies them entry unless they first defeat it. During their battle, Clive is forced to counter an incoming comet cast by the beast, as Joshua is too weak to cast a ward. However, instead of turning to Ifrit, Joshua lends him a hand, the two of them besting the beast together, their combined strength making up for their individual weaknesses. Making for the heart of the crystal through the castle, they are cornered by the countless Akashic roaming its grounds. However, when all seems hopeless, the Enterprise comes bursting through the walls of the Citadel, carrying Jill, Dion, and their other allies to the rescue. However, the final trial is reserved for Clive and Joshua alone, as Ultima bids the Sons of Fire welcome, drawing them into another dimension, Torgal being the only one able to give chase. Meanwhile, the others are faced with yet another horde of Akashic, fighting for Clive's and Joshua's safe return. Inside Ultima's darkness, an interdimensional rift between worlds, Clive and Joshua are invited to reflect on the sins of man. Ultima appears before them, taking them back to the beginning, when the world was still young and his kind bestowed magic upon it, making it flourish. However, the price for this boon would be heavy, as it brought on the Blight, forcing the Ultima Collective to flee so that they might endure, their journey taking them to a land free of the Blight's corruption. The journey required them to shed their fleshy bodies, but in the end they found Valisthea, a land as pure as driven snow, but the Black followed them. Hoping to create a new world free of the Blight, they conspired to cast a powerful magic, requiring not only power, but also the constitution to wield it. Using the Mother Crystals, they acquired power, but in order to acquire a suitable vessel, they created humanity, sowing the seeds so that Mythos might one day emerge as their vessel. Having set their plans in motion, they went to sleep. But that would prove a great mistake, because as humanity awoke, alone, in a world bereft of God's radiance and guidance, man sought to create his own light in the darkness, and thus was his will born. Will in hand, man looked inward and found that he desired ever more that which only magic could afford, his greed leading to wars. All the while, the land wept tears of black. Clive and Joshua discover the remains of one of Ultima's many discarded vessels, Ultima Prime, it now being time for Mythos to become the new one. 
As Clive attempts to transform into Ifrit, his flame is snuffed out by Ultima, who tells him that all he owns is his precious will, the rest belonging to him. The brothers do battle with Ultima, but even as they strike him down, Ultima is pleased to see that the vessel has become strong enough. Pushed by Ultima, Clive enters his own mind, where he sees the people that mean the most to him assembled at Rosalith Castle, asking him to relinquish his will. He then sees Benedicta and Kupka trapped in the castle's holding cells, being consumed by their own wills, which led to their untimely demise. Sleipnir and Barnabas, all the while having long learned this lesson. Joshua, however, refuses to let his brother succumb, calling out to him, providing the tether needed to bring him back from surrendering his will to this would-be god. Having once again failed to claim his vessel, Ultima ponders as to the reason Joshua was able to rescue his brother, surmising that perhaps their wills are so potent that they harbor even the power of creation. Combining their powers and turning into a freed risen of their own accord, the brothers blast Ultima, who recognizes them no longer as Mythos, but as Logos, the force from their attack destroying the last Mother Crystal. Appearing in Twinside, Ultima calls upon Origin, summoning forth a floating island encased in crystal, the land's ether converging at that single point hastening the spread of the blight even further. Returning to the hideaway, the outlaws plot are best to counter Ultima's ploy as he continues to gather power within Origin's shell, deciding that Bahamut's wings will carry Clive and Joshua as the three of them go to face Ultima. Before they leave, Clive bids farewell to Jill, saying he'll be back so that they can watch the moon together again. As the three men set out, they bid farewell to their comrades, mid giving each of them a hug. Clive leaves Gav in charge, and Joshua thanks Yote for her service, before being scolded by Tarja for failing to take care of his health. Byron sends the brothers off, and Clive bids his goodbyes to Jill and Torgal, telling Torgal to watch over Jill. Jill tells Clive to believe in his path, and Clive tells her that he loves her, Jill replying in kind. As the two brothers fly off on Bahamut's back, Jill prays for their safe return. Approaching Origin, they are intercepted by a horde of Thrall, Dion blowing a hole in the crystal's exterior so that they may enter. Once inside, Ultima describes Origin as their Ark, telling them they slumbered there for centuries, clinging to their decrepit shell in fear that they might have need of it once again. But with Clive there, they will now finally have their vessel. Attacking Ultima together, Ultima fends them off single-handedly, proving a formidable foe, even against the combined power of three dominants. After hitting Ultima with a three-pronged attack, Ultima retaliates, forcing Dion to take a fatal hit to save the brothers. Having atoned for his crimes at the cost of his life, Eon tells his father that his work is done, as he soars through the open air one last time. Inside Origin, Joshua heals Clive, weakening himself, so that Clive must support him as they march on towards the core of the structure. There they discover the Nexus, a wellspring of life, where Ultima plans to raise their kin from their eternal slumber, each one having sacrificed their flesh to become the beating heart of a crystal that drained the land of its ether. That is, until they were set free by the destruction of the Mother Crystals. Letting Clive and the others destroy the Mother Crystals, having been a part of Ultima's plan all along. Welcoming his brother home, Ultima calls forth the manifestation of themselves trapped within Joshua. Joshua finally being unable to contain him as Ultima's strength has grown. The manifestations of Ultima merge, becoming one. And as Joshua teeters on the brink of death, he asks Clive to have faith in a better world. Their bonds provide Clive the strength necessary to oppose Ultima, as Joshua bestows upon him the essence of the Phoenix. Lastly, Joshua tells Clive that he is proud to have had him as a brother, before finally dying. 
Having merged, Ultima summons Clive into the rift once more. Clive, clinging to his bonds with his brother, even in death, denying Ultima to the very end. They fight, and Ultima admonishes him for profaning this moment they have waited for for so long. But try as he might to cleanse Clive of his will, Clive remains steadfast. When Ultima isn't able to snuff out Clive's will, he asks whether he has truly become Logos, whether he has truly become free. Not one to take such an insult to godhood, Ultima takes on the form of Ultima Risen, engaging in a godlike battle with Clive as Ifrit Risen. However, as Clive bests him, his will being stronger than his, Ultima transforms into Ultimalius, Ultimalius being the incarnation that brought the last of his race to safety in Valsthea. Ultimalius promises Clive eternal anguish, but even in his ultimate form, Clive still bests Ultima, using his own divine powers against him better than the god himself does. Clive tells him that what led to his fall was not banding with others and thinking only of himself. Clive then finishes their battle with a crude, albeit poetic, fist to the face, as a man takes down God with the power of man. With Ultima defeated, Clive tells him that even though they don't know what the future holds, they will face it on their own imperfect terms, facing the horizon ever out of reach, yet still marching on. Clive then draws Ultima's ether into himself, returning to origin. There he embraces Joshua, remembering all they've been through, and how that when they were young, they always stood with one another, him becoming his shield, receiving the blessing with a phoenix, Clive having loved him from the moment he entered this world. Using the power of the phoenix, Clive tries to revive Joshua, but although he manages to heal his wounds, it is unclear whether he is successful. Afterwards, Clive realizes that Ultima's powers is too much for him and that he can't contain it, so he chooses to use it while he has it to destroy Ultima's legacy, putting an end to bearers, dominance, crystals, magic, consigning them to the flames, even if it costs him his life. A pillar of light reaches into the sky as the crystal around Origin shatters. Clive then finds himself washed up on a distant shore, his hand petrified, asking himself whether Jill too can see the moon. Back at the hideaway, Etta gives birth to the first child in a free world, and as Jill looks out the window, she sees Metia's light fade, overrun with tears, as she imagines what it might mean. And thus did their journey end. Many years in the future, two boys live in a forest with their mother. The dark-haired one wishing he could use fire magic to light a fire, like the icons in the fairy tales. His mother reminding him that magic only exists in stories. On the table rests a book entitled Final Fantasy, whose authorship is attributed to Joshua Rossfield. Thanks for watching. I hope you liked the video, and that you've almost cleaned out your bowels. Remember? We talked about pooping in the beginning. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, which would be sort of crazy if you made it this far. Special thanks to our wonderful Patreon supporters, who have been gracious enough to support our humble channel. The beauty of their souls, only matched by the size of their wallets. If you want to be more like them, then please head over to Patreon and join our little community there. Hope to see you around. <laughs> it's over. It's over. Can't believe it's over.